Hi, I'm Philip Presley. I'm a PhD student in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at North Carolina State University. And today I'm going to be talking about material recovery facilities within the S4. So we're going to start out with just kind of an overview of what a MRF is, kind of go into what kind of MRFs we, we've modeled and what kind of exists throughout the world, as well as um, the data we've developed um, and how we did that. Uh, go through kind of some overarching high-level equations that we've used and then some illustrative results. So what is a, a MRF? Uh, material recovery facility or MRF is going to separate an input waste stream into saleable recyclables and a residual stream that must be treated further. So some examples of those saleable recyclables would be aluminum, metals, plastic, mixed paper, etc. So the MRF process model we've created is going to calculate costs, um, output masses, and resource consumption for separating one megagram or a metric ton of input mass to a MRF um, with a particular equipment layout and facility size. So we've modeled four MRF types here. Um, a single stream MRF, which accepts one stream of commingled recyclables. A lot of times you see these in suburban or urban areas like we see here in Raleigh where you put out a residual can with all of your waste um, that's not recycled and then beside it you have a recyclable bin um, and it's kind of all the source separated recyclables that you've created. And then we have a dual stream MRF which instead of having one recycling bin on the curb would have two. You'd have a container stream which would contain plastic containers as well as metal cans and then in a separate contain in a separate recyclable bin, you'd have a fiber stream, which would have mixed paper and OCC or old corrugated containers. So then we have a pre-sorted MRF, which a lot of times you would put only put one bin out on the curb, um, and when someone drove by, they would pick up the recycle bin and sort it there on site. So basically, the pre-sorted MRF is going to accept an aluminum stream, a ferrous stream, etc. All of them will already be separated by the time they get there. Um, another source for, of a, for pre-sorted material would be drop-off locations. And then a mixed waste MRF just means that there is no source separation. It's just a single stream of waste placed out the curb and then from that a material is recovered. So just kind of to look at this graphically, what we see is that um, going from top to bottom, we see that there's a, a mass in to the MRF, and then the model is going to be able to tell us the mass of each recovered stream with its composition, as well as the mass and composition of the residual stream. Simultaneously, if we go from left to right, we're going to see that the user is going to put in inputs to describe this system. Uh, modeled, and then we're going to be able to calculate direct emissions, resource consumption, specifically electricity and diesel use, um, as well as the capital and operating costs. So, what kind of materials can we recover? Um, there, there's a lot of different variations. Um, our model is currently set up to handle mixed paper and old corrugated containers or OCC, um, which is like a cardboard box as well as metals, um, which would just be ferrous and aluminum cans, uh, glass, and then several kinds of plastics. Uh, we, we are aware that there are other kinds of plastics that can be recycled. Um, some of these um, could be easily added, but our current analysis does not include any of those. So we've kind of separated those our MRF types into two, two groups. MRFs that process source separated recyclables and then the mixed waste MRF which only accepts one stream. So as we see here MRFs interact with a large part of the system. Y we see that you know the recovered material is going to go to remanufacturing um, it has to be collected upstream and then the residual stream could go to a waste energy plant or to a landfill. So that's a large part of the system that um, MRFs interact with. So what we see here is a process flow diagram for our default MRF configuration. Um, it's important to note that this 
is a very technical modern MRF. All, a lot of these boxes do represent automation. Um, some do represent manual sorts. However, our model um, is set to this configuration currently. So we kind of assume that at a high level, we're going to pull out fiber using these disk screens first. And then we're going to pull out glass using a glass breaker screen and then some optical sorting technology. Then from there, the stream goes to some plastic optical sorters as well as a magnet and eddy current separator. So it's very complex and it there is a lot of detail here. Um, just due to our time constraints, we're going to kind of skip through this. If you have any questions, please let me know at the end. We understand that there's a difference between an automated MRF and a manual MRF and that the level of automation in MRFs varies tremendously over the industry. So what we've tried to do is make a model that's flexible. We want it to be able to incorporate facilities that are completely automated and some that are far less automated and have a lot more manual separation. So each material except for glass has an option to be recovered manually, not be recovered at all, or to be recovered via automated equipment. And the reason we haven't included manual separation for glass here is because we found that it's uncommon in the industry and often endangers um, the health of the pickers. So this is a dual stream MRF. If we look in the box on the left, we see that there's two drum feeders. This is one additional drum feeder than what we saw in the single stream MRF. And we see that the materials that go in the top are the fiber and the materials going in the bottom part are containers. The ma each e equipment stream can be a little bit smaller because the residual from the fiber stream is not present in the container stream and the fiber stream including the disc screens does not have to accommodate the extra mass associated with the container stream. So this is the pre-sorted. We see it's a lot different in general. There's very little separation equipment and primarily what it's wanting to do is pull out any kind of contaminants. However, in the situation of glass, it does utilize a glass breaker screen and then sorts off the air knife and sorts it by color. There is a manual sort here, but note this is not broken glass. That manual sort happens with when the it's just glass bottles. So now we're going to talk about mixed waste MRFs. So a mixed waste MRF, as you can tell, often comes from mixed waste residual collection and it can be tied to a waste energy facility or a landfill. And as in the commingled MRF, we see that the separated streams that come out of the mixed waste MRF often go to material reprocessing. So a mixed waste MRF process flow diagram is identical to our single stream diagram except that there's a trauma located between the drum feeder and the initial ma manual sort. This trauma is going to remove the organic fraction, specifically the food waste, and often targets materials that are smaller than two inches in diameter. So the data we've developed throughout um, our process was primarily based on discussions with MRF operators, equipment vendors, and when those were unavailable, we used our engineering judgment. The primary reason that we don't have peer-reviewed literature and other more commonly available data was just due to availability. Um, some of the data types we needed to have were the equipment data, which often includes the cost, the motor size, um, separation efficiencies, and we'll talk more about those in a moment, as well as the maximum throughput or the capacity of the equipment. We also talk about facility data and that incorporates the cost, the actual size of the building, as well as electricity consumption associated with offices and lighting and other non-equipment needs. So here's kind of some sample data. Um, we see that there's a throughput as well as a motor capacity, some different utilization factors, as well as cost data and lifetimes. It's important to note that as we go through, we can put any values here that we need to, um, just because we do see similar values for O&M costs and the utilization fractions that is not required by the model. So here's our mass balance. 
we see on the left that we have an input mask and it's going to be separated into a removed stream and a remaining stream. And so in the case of a magnet, it would take input mass and it would turn the remo it would remove ferrous or um, and we would call that the remove stream and it would allow the remaining mass to which would be aluminum and other residual fractions to continue on through the facility. So to separate the removed mass, we're going to use separation of efficiencies in the model. So our mass removed is calculated by taking a separation efficiency and multiplying it by a mass throughput. And a separation efficiency here is going to be the fraction of a, an individual material that is removed by that particular piece of equipment. So for example, if the magnet shown below re removes 90% of the ferrous that goes into it, we would have a separation efficiency equal to 90%. It wouldn't apply at all to the aluminum or any other fractions that would go through. Those would continue on unimpeded if that was in fact the case. So then to calculate the remaining stream, we just kind of use arithmetic. We know the mass that goes in and we've used the separation efficiency to calculate the removed. So we subtract those two to get the remaining mass or the third stream. We also understand that different equipment has different purposes within individual MRFs. So we want to make sure that we could accommodate a, a different kinds of allocation. Um, we know that you put magnets in MRFs to recover ferrous. You put um, optical sorters in to recover glass and plastic. And so allocating all of the cost and resource use to total throughput isn't always appropriate, nor is it always appropriate to allocate it to the removed mass or the remaining mass. So what we've allowed is for each piece of equipment, you can allocate mass separately. So our default configuration allows for the mass removed for equipment um, that's used to remove certain waste fractions, like those magnets and optical sorters, we're just going to allocate that to the mass removed. For everything else, things like disc screens or glass breaker screens that we use to separate two fractions from each other, both of which benefit, or things like a, d a drum feeder, which just has a mechanistic purpose, we're going to allocate that to the total throughput. However, if you are doing analysis that it would benefit you to use another choice, um, it is easy to change the allocation for a particular piece of equipment. So here's kind of our sample resource consumption um, by MRF type. But before we, before we look too much of this, we should clearly state that there is no way that we can look at these numbers and determine which MRF is better. There's inconsistent functional units. Each of these MRFs to be implemented within a system requires a different kind of collection, different kind of support processes. So for us to look across these and say, oh, there's a pre-sorted MRF, it uses less electricity, and it's the cheapest, that's the better MRF or the best MRF is inappropriate. We should not do that under any circumstance. However, at a high level, we can just kind of comment on how the MRFs relatively perform, but understand that these do not have system levels, system level um, implications. So we do see that the high contamination increases equipment size and electricity demand in mixed waste MRFs. But since there's lower labor costs, the total cost is less than the single stream and dual stream MRFs. We see that the smaller equipment allows dual stream MRFs to have lower costs and electricity consumption than the single stream MRF. And once again, that's because we see that the container stream does not have to go through the disc screens and other components of the fiber stream, nor does the fiber residual need to go through the container stream equipment. We also see that pre-sorted MRFs as you would expect, have the lowest cost and electricity consumption just because they're s relatively simple and lack much of the automation of the other MRFs. So here's kind of a very bright and colorful figure um, that kind of illustrates the waste composition and how that can alter the different MRF electricity consumption. Um, here we've only shown the single stream MRF. So glass separation equipment accounts for 10% of the MRF electricity consumption. But we see that each other sep each other type of separation equipment accounts for less than that. It's important to note here that uh, off-selectricity 
as well as the lights in the warehouse each account for 8% of total electricity and that we see an almost 100% swing based on composition of electricity consumption per megagram. It's a really large swing and a lot of that has to do with exactly what pieces of equipment have been included. As you would expect the ODEQ which represents an organ waste stream has a lot less glass in it hence the much smaller um, glass and glass breaker screen and glass optical sorter energy requirement. So here's some references. Um, the first paper is a waste management article we have recently published and details this model exactly. And we also have another article that contains a description of a refuse derived fuel model and its supplemental information. We'd like to thank the National Science Foundation and the Environmental Research and Education Foundation for their support on this project.